So I want to say welcome to those folks that are coming on. We're going to begin in a couple of minutes. As you know, we try to go just slightly past the, the point um, so that folks that are trying to get on will be able to get on. So we'll be underway in a moment. All right, so I think we're, uh, we're still adding folk, but we're gonna go ahead and begin. We want to make sure that we respect the time of our guests and also of other people who are joining us. I know there are other people that are getting to us from other time zones as well. So we wanna make sure uh, that we respect their time. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for um, our diaspora lecture. Uh, Many of you may uh, be aware, but for those that aren't, the Diaspora Lecture is uh, now almost 20 years old with us. Uh, we were fortunate to have uh, opened the Stone Center during a moment when the focus on the diaspora as a, as a very, very important point of departure was taking off and we've been able to stick with it for some time. And we're really, really happy that you uh, stuck with it with us. It means it's taken us to a number of places, not only um, across the water, but we have had very, very interesting and important engagements throughout the Caribbean, throughout Latin America, all the way down through Argentina with colleagues there. And we're very, very happy uh, to have a very special guest with us tonight. I wanna make a couple of announcements before I introduce the guest and, and let her tell us what the title is gonna be. I first want to uh, thank all of you who were part of the program that we had last night and the previous day. Um, we also uh, want to, to let you know that this particular program also is being co-sponsored by the Alliance Group of Centers here at UNC at Chapel Hill. And we're very happy to have the direct support of the Carolina Latina Center, Latinx Center, pardon me, Carolina Latinx Center I'm going back to some old names here, the Carolina Latinx Center, uh, one of our alliance partners and one of the key supporters of this particular program. Thank you so much for joining us and happy that you're here with us this evening as well. Um, <clears throat> the other uh, tradition that, that we want to honor is to let folks know that there are people in the community and people across uh, UNC who also have been very, very supportive in putting this program on. And we wanna make sure that you know that we also appreciate uh, your efforts. Uh, this evening, as I said, we are very, very fortunate. I don't think that uh, Professor Jones knows that when we first saw her book, I ran into Cherie's office and I said, we have to get her, we have to get her. And I would go in every day after to say, have you reached her yet? Have you reached her yet? Has she responded? And, and one day he said, oh yeah, she said she'd do it. So I was so happy uh, to see, first of all, that this text had come out because some of the communities you're talking about are communities that I know. And some of the subjects and topics that you cover are topics that we are still interrogating here, uh, as are many people across the country. 
Uh, professor Jennifer Jones uh, is currently an associate professor uh, in Latin American and Latino studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, she specializes, as you might suspect, in race and ethnicity, immigration, political sociology, Latinx studies, Afro-Latinx studies, and Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, her work can be found in journals such as Context, International Migration Review, Sociology of Race and Ethnicity, Ethnic and Racial Studies, and Latino Studies. Um, what she's going to be referring to tonight is her first book, and um, it's going to be very difficult for her to do much better than what we find in this particular text. Uh, it's called The Browning of the New South, published by University of Chicago Press. And she's looking at a case study of shifting race relations and the experiences of Mexican immigrants who settled in the Winston-Salem area of North Carolina to explore regional racial change. And as many of you know, we have tried uh, at various points in time to connect with that community and have invited them here uh, to talk with us uh, using support from the Humanities Council. So having you do the full exploration is really, really gratifying for us. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to turn it over to Professor Jones and let her do her presentation. And then we're going to, of course, give you our community an opportunity to ask questions. You'll note that you don't have access to a chat function, but you do have access to a Q&A function. So please, if you will, uh, you can place your questions there and I'll make sure that uh, Professor Jones is, is able to uh, hear your questions. In fact, I'll read them out loud. If you put your name there, I'll even put your name there as well. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to, to Dr. Jones. And um, if there's anything else that we can do for you along the way, let us know. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that warm introduction. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen, so bear with me while I do the technology part. And hopefully this will work. Let's see. Yes, we do have your notes at the bottom. There. OK, now we still have your notes on the right. I think your other view was the the one we were looking for. And it seemed to have switched on me. All right, let me see if I can fix this real quick. OK, <laughs> uh, no problem. Take your time. Uh, let's see. Screen share again. All right, how are we doing now? Still have your notes on the bottom. Really? Mm -hmm. OK. We'll try one more way. <laughs> Maybe For those who are listening in, we were we were working with this, but... <laughs> and I thought it was fixed. But yeah, we have we have the uh, collusion between the Zoom gods and the PowerPoint right. gods. Now we have it. That's it. Yay! Okay, I will I will not mess with it any further. Great. Um, thank you again for having me and for welcoming me virtually to the Stone Center. I wish I could be with you in person. I'd love to be in North Carolina right now. It is quite cold in Chicago. Um, but I'm hoping that my work will spark a really generative conversation and we can continue to talk in the future. Um, I also want to thank everyone at the Stone Center, especially uh, Dr. Joseph Jordan and Sharif Drama, as well as the various students and staff who coordinate this event. Um, I'm so excited to be here and share my work with all of you. Um, and I want to share that I've developed this talk in the spirit of contribution to Black thought. Um, so while it's not only or perhaps not even primarily about African Americans and Afro descendants through the diaspora, which is the mission of the center, in this work I'm arguing that race and racial identity is similarly constructed through the lens of blackness, both ideologically and materially. That is, race for Latinx immigrants at this time is made real through their experiences with black people and their understanding of their experiences as similar to them. And so in that sense, I'm aligning myself with the legacy of Black thinkers who I think, uh, on the one hand, articulate a framework of racial status to understand how race is lived, experienced, understood, and as such is deeply political. And I'm thinking of writers like uh, Du Bois, Lonnie Guinier, and Michael Dawson. 
And I also aim to highlight the importance of the South in shaping American identity and thought. And here I'm thinking of, again, Du Bois, but also authors like Imani Perry and Zandria Robinson. Um, and so as was already mentioned, this work is based on my book, The Browning of the New South, which dives more deeply into the contributions than I can present to you today, but I'm looking forward to further discussion and hopefully I can answer any additional questions that might come up in the Q&A. Hmm. Okay. So in 2008, journalist Roberto Lovato coined this term Juan Crow, and he used it in an article for uh, The Nation magazine to criticize contemporary immigration enforcement by comparing it to Jim Crow laws. In that piece, Lovato refers to the matrix of laws, social customs, economic institutions, and symbolic systems enabling the physical and psychic isolation needed to control and exploit undocumented immigrants. Omnibus laws in Arizona, Alabama, Georgia, and Texas, as well as California's 1994 Proposition 187 have all been considered Juan Crow laws. And while it's important to underscore that these laws disproportionately impact Black and Latinx, but not European and Asian migrants, and to question the appropriateness of this comparison, I nevertheless argue that this discursive move is a powerful indicator of the ways in which Latinx people in the US, especially the US South, are seen and understood. And so in this talk, I'm gonna articulate how Mexican origin immigrants and Mexican Americans came to be racialized through the lens of the Black experience and the political and social implications of this process. So in recent years, as I'm sure you're all aware, the ringing of alarm bells over the so-called browning of America have become louder and more intense. Over the last several decades, census takers and demographers have written and rewritten demographic projections advising that racial, racial change is happening even faster than anticipated, predicting a majority minority nation by 2045. And depending on where you live, this shift may feel as though it's already happened. Numerous municipalities from Los Angeles to Charlotte have already tipped. And in 2012, there were more non-whites born in the United States than whites for the first time. And as you know, among many Americans, such change has produced panic and political backlash. Leo Chavez, Otto Santa Ana, and really anyone who followed the rhetoric and continues to of the Trump administration have argued that much of this fear hinges on the perception that Latinx folks in particular are taking over. In part, these fears are loosely grounded in social fact. So it is true that more than half of the foreign born growth in the US population between the 1990s and early 2000s was due to growth in the Latinx population. Latinxes are now the largest minority group, and not only has the share of the Latinx population increased dramatically, but Latinx populations during this period spread out faster than any immigration wave in US history, internal or external, including the Great Migration. So while Latinos uh, certainly continue to settle overwhelmingly in traditional destinations such as California, Arizona, and New York, an increasing number of Latinxes, especially recent immigrants, are moving to new destinations like the US South. Indeed, by 2010, 36% of Latinxes were in the South. And so these population shifts raise important questions about racial formation, about immigrant incorporation, and intergroup relations, as the US is in fact changing. And yet how Latinxes will become integrated into American communities and reshape social life in these communities is not well understood. So my work seeks to understand what this newly triracial landscape will look like and asks, what is the on the ground impact of demographic change on race relations and state politics? For the Southeast in particular, this population shift raises important questions about racial formation and immigrant incorporation, as well as intergroup relations in a region that, as you know, has had a complex racial history, and yet until relatively recently has not dealt with immigration in a meaningful way. So immigrant newcomers are now finding themselves in a variety of Southern towns and suburbs where their presence is challenging and in many cases, not welcome. 
Uh, and so while I'm interested in these changing dynamics throughout the southern region, I'm building my case analysis in this study through the uh, case study of Winston-Salem, which is in the metro, in the Winston-Salem metro area, rather, in Forsyth County, which is circled here. I don't know if you can see my pointer, in the northwest quadrant of North Carolina. Um, and as you are probably well aware, North Carolina has experienced some of the fastest, most dramatic growth in the Latinx population in the region. And Forsyth County experienced some of the fastest growth in the state alongside Durham, Wake, and Mecklenburg counties, where of course Durham and Charlotte are located. Um, and so just to give you a better sense of the population distribution in the area here, green dots represent uh, whites, blue, blacks, and orange Latinxes, with most people clustered in the Winston-Salem metro area and then neighboring Greensboro. And you can see that Winston has slightly more Latinxes than that across the county. Blacks and whites remain somewhat segregated from one another. And so in the larger book project, I'm investigating and explaining the dynamics of increased migration to the South and how these new Southern destinations have in turn responded to change, looking at the relationship between demographic change, Mexican racialization and intergroup relations. Today, I'm gonna focus on the part of my work that focuses on positive interminority relations and how Latinx immigrants come to express a sense of minority linked fate with African-Americans by making sense of their own experiences through the lens of Blackness and through their experiences with Black neighbors, community members, and authority figures. So I situate the finding of minority-linked fate as a puzzle. And I'm sure you're well aware that the expectation of intergroup relations is that they're defined by conflict. So from what we know about the intergroup relations in the social science literature, it overwhelmingly predicts that racial groups are in conflict. In fact, for some, conflict and competition is the thing that defines racial groups themselves. That is, without conflict and hierarchy, there is no race. Moreover, much of the literature on Black Latinx relations empirically asserts that relations between these two groups are especially poor, despite numerous shared interests. In fact, scholars, journalists, and conventional wisdom all indicate that throughout the US, tensions between Blacks and Latinxes is high. Indeed, in the small but growing literature on race relations in the so-called New South, that is what scholars are finding. Relations between Blacks and Latinxes appear to be riddled with conflict and competition, as well as a strong sense of group threat. And to a lesser extent, in the absence of conflict, scholars are finding some ambivalence between the two groups. Very few scholars have uncovered or theorized positive Black Latinx relations in the region. Um, and so in practice, a lot of this conflict is explained as intergroup threat. So the vast majority of the intergroup literature posits that groups experience a sense of threat when they're in close proximity to each other. Among Blacks and Latinxes in particular, this is theorized as competition due to the assumption that both groups share an equal position um, as Blacks and Latinxes are presumed to be at the bottom of the social structure and therefore have a relatively tenuous relationship to the labor market. And in fact, a number of studies that explore new destinations find evidence of competition between minority groups, not only in the labor market, but also for housing and other resources such as healthcare and education. And this competition is understood to be a catalyst for instigating stereotypes and negative interracial attitudes. Black Latino conflict in the US has also become a kind of normative trope in both the scholarly literature and popular discourse used to explain everything from a failure of minority candidates to build effective coalitions and win elections to the killing of Trayvon Martin in 2012. And yet despite these theories, there's growing evidence of alliance and cooperation between these two groups. So aware of this conventional wisdom of Black Latinx conflict, throughout my time in Winston, I was puzzled to find that regardless of phenotype, region of origin, or time in the US, Latinx migrants overwhelmingly, though not exclusively, reported that they got along better with Blacks, and that alliances between the two groups were appearing across the region. Time and time again, Latinxes reported counting African Americans among their friendliest neighbors and coworkers. And more importantly, they reported strong feelings of closeness and just as frequently perceived African-Americans as allies in the struggle against discrimination. Moreover, while there were exceptions, this viewpoint was frequently bolstered by the actions of Black folks in their communities. Most of the time, this came in the form of official messaging and political engagement from church leaders, activists, city bureaucrats, and service providers. 
but it also came informally in the form of generous neighbors, friendly parents, jovial coworkers, and thoughtful teachers. And this contrasted greatly with many Latinx's perceptions of white Americans in my study who they were largely segregated from and perceived as discriminatory and distant. And so this finding was entirely contrary to what many scholars have found regarding race relations and immigration, which characterize those relations as highly antagonistic. So because Black Latinx uh, positive relations are neither predicted nor well explained by the literature, I ask, how do we explain this divergent outcome? So the intergroup relations literature focuses overwhelmingly on the role of socioeconomic status in shaping intergroup relations. And I argue that this framing assumes a shared low socioeconomic status among all minorities, failing to adequately consider the role of race in shaping intergroup relations, and does not sufficiently account for the dynamic interaction between these two statuses in shaping intergroup relations, problematically treating race as epiphenomenal to class. In their analysis of racialization and racial solidarity projects, legal scholars Lani Guinier and Gerald Torres note that we often fail to consider the fullness of racialization projects. That is when we emphasize racial boundaries, the significance of phenotype and the privileges and penalties associated with racial identity and ascription, we forget to acknowledge that race also contains possibilities for liberation projects through what they call political race. And they argue because race is not merely historical or cultural, but political, political projects that undermine power structures that distribute privileges to some and punishments to others along racial lines will also require political racial projects. So in calling for politics that asks, with whom do you link your fate? They argue cross-racial politics are key to achieving social change. And the idea of political race as a democratic social movement aimed at bringing about constructive change within the larger community relies on the actualization of what I call minority linked faith. So as Gwynir and Torres note, cross-racial politics happen among groups when they see that their fate is linked to others who are like them. They see that what happens to one happens to many others, if not most others who are similarly situated. It is this process of building minority linked faith that links together not only Black people, as Dawson finds, or Latinxes and Asians, as the pan ethnicity scholarship suggests, but various marginalized non whites who come to think, behave, and practice a sense of minority linked faith that can lead to political racial projects. So while cooperation, collaboration, and coalition building between minority groups are infrequently examined outcomes of intergroup relations, I argue that such efforts are in fact far from rare and have a great deal to tell us about how race works. They also play an important role in shaping race relations and racial identities, resulting in a dialectic set of relations in which perceptions about shared status can also shape perceptions about the self. In other words, to truly explain and predict whether intergroup relations will be positive, negative, or neutral, we need to theorize race as an independent social category paying attention to group understandings of their own and relative status within the racial hierarchy. Groups are most likely to get along when they believe that racial status is shared. How racial status is understood is developed independently from, but intersectionally with, class. I argue that conceptualizing race and economic status as distinct but dialectical processes and practices that shape intergroup relations, we can better capture how interminority relations are forged, with unequal economic status and equal racial status leading to positive relations and potentially minority linked faith. So using this framework, I identify four conditions under which positive intergroup relations can emerge. So first, in terms of class, low resource competition is a necessary but not sufficient condition under which positive intergroup relations can occur. And this is best facilitated through unequal economic status. Next, you need to facilitate a sense of shared racial status. And this, I argue, is done in three ways. First, perceived threat can be ameliorated by sustained positive contact. Second, a shared sense of discrimination can facilitate positive relations. And finally, there's a need for a perceived collective external threat to organize and frame grievances against. And so in the rest of this talk, I'm going to explain how closeness emerged on the ground, drawing on this conceptual framing of status to explain its emergence. 
Um, before I get into those details, I just want to quickly note that this study is part of a large project in which I examine Mexican migration in both sending and receiving communities. I'm going to talk today mostly about the targeted participant observation and interview data I collected in Winston-Salem, but um, I did a lot of work, so I'm happy to answer any questions about the larger study in the Q&A. So uh, now that I've laid out this puzzle and theoretical framework, I want to use the rest of the time to focus on these types of positive relations that emerged and what mechanisms played a role in shaping those relations. I'm going to then conclude by discussing the broader implications of this work. So I divide my data analysis of closeness into four sections, community context, in which I'm going to explain how some of the defining features of Winston-Salem shaped Black Latinx relations. Uh, Mexicans' positive perceptions of Black Latinx relations, which I argue are shaped through positive contact with African Americans in their community. Uh, Anti-immigrant attitudes, which I argue uh, forge a sense of shared discrimination among Blacks and Mexicans, and a sense of shared external threat from whites. And community partnerships, in which Blacks use their higher socioeconomic status to shore up a sense of shared discrimination, reinforcing those positive relations and underscoring a sense of shared external threat in whites. Um, and then I'm going to conclude with some implications from these findings. So throughout my study, I uncovered that Winston-Salem context played a really important role in understanding why cooperation or conflict between Blacks and Latinx has emerged and what sets race relations here apart from previous Southern studies of intergroup relations. So like much of the region, Winston-Salem underwent this massive demographic change due to increased migration in the 1990s. And so here you can see in this map, in 1990, we see that there were virtually no Latinxes in the area. Um, Again, we see in 2000, there was significant growth in the population. And then by 2010, we see that the population of Latinxes was substantial. And so this change meant that new Latinxes were settling into a context in which there were few long-term co-ethnics and into an area that had long been known for its segregation of black and white community members. In this way, Winston is very similar to other cities and towns in the region and perhaps throughout the United States that experience significant population growth as a result of economic expansion into highly segregated communities. Um, here is just a, another way of looking at the same information. You can see the population distribution of Blacks, Whites, and Latinxes in the area. Again, Blacks in blue, Latinxes in orange, and Whites in green. Um, and so as the Winston-Salem economy shifted and expanded in the 1990s to include more white collar positions available to African Americans, Blacks began to move out of the rental and lower quality housing units near the downtown area and into larger single family homes in those same neighborhoods. This is not an uncommon practice as Mary Patillo's work on the Black middle class suggests, working lower and middle class minorities often live in the same communities. Here in Winston-Salem, the less expensive, lower quality housing created an easy pocket of available housing stock for Mexican newcomers to move into in or near Black neighborhoods in town. So as a result, Latinxes arriving in Winston-Salem quickly settled into a stable middle class African American community. And because there was little competition for housing, respondents often indicated that this transition of Latinx is moving into their neighborhoods, um, that is African American respondents, was relatively smooth. Many respondents talked about this as a revitalizing process because properties that were empty were now being populated by families. And so as a result, Mexicans experiences of living in black neighborhoods where they shared institutions and space created new opportunities for social contact without this kind of resource threat of housing. Moreover, Latinx's settlement in these black neighborhoods meant that contact with blacks was juxtaposed against a dearth of interpersonal relationships with whites who didn't often live in those same communities. What sets Winston-Salem apart though from many neighboring cities um, is that it, Blacks had a consistent upward mobility despite segregation. And this was possible in part because Winston has always had a relatively strong economy due to its position as the center of tobacco manufacturing. 
So Winston has continually needed uh, outside labor, consistently drawing workers from around the state and across the region attracted to the promise of stable blue collar wages and a low cost of living. Moreover, it's been an educational center with three universities within its city limits, including a historically black university. And this image is uh, working workers in a stemming room of a tobacco factory from 1938. Um, here we see Slater Industrial Academy and the state normal uh, school graduation class of 1908, which later became Winston-Salem State University. Uh, and then here again in 1965. And so as the political power of Reynolds Tobacco and Haynes Hosiery, which served as the cornerstone of Winston-Salem's labor market for decades, receded in the 1970s and 80s, the economy actually began to expand. In the 80s and 90s, Winston-Salem was still bolstered by big tobacco, but also became a major hub for corporate headquarters in the financial airline and manufacturing industries, as well as a center for medical research. And this dramatically increased the number of white collar jobs available in the area. And as a result, many African Americans, particularly those educated at its historically black university, moved into managerial and professional occupations. So this combined increase of upward mobility among African Americans, economic expansion and overemployment meant that employers in the region had a great incentive to recruit labor at a variety of skill levels. Predictably then in the 1990s, Latinxes were recruited to fill jobs in labor, service and construction and demographic change as I've mentioned was swift. Still blacks and Latinxes did not generally compete for the same jobs. So um, this is a graph of employed blacks uh, by occupation sector. This is just descriptive statistics. And it suggests that blacks continue to move up into white collar occupations over time and that fewer were employed and low skilled work. Um, similarly, Latinxes by contrast were overwhelmingly concentrated in labor and service occupations. So uh, in fact, according to a 2005 Pew report on Lat Latinos in the New South, there were no signs of black displacement in labor. Um, in Southern counties, sorry about that. In Southern counties that experienced new uh, Latinx settlement, we saw no displacement. And in Winston-Salem, like the conditions in many previous studies, Mexicans have settled into a community where the local and state government context has changed to become more hostile towards immigrants. At the same time, however, Winston-Salem retained this robust minority middle class and stable labor market, reducing a sense of competition between Latinxes and other groups. So in this way, the community context provided an essential backdrop of low resource competition through unequal socioeconomic status alongside ample opportunities for intergroup contexts. So in this next section, I'm gonna talk about how the quality of context serves to shape Mexican perceptions of blacks as friends and allies and of similar racial status. So as I've noted, many blacks and Latinxes worked in the same neighborhoods and lived there as well, creating numerous opportunities for contact. Eliana, who was a young Mexican woman who had come directly to Winston from Guerrero when she was 12 years old, told me a little bit about her experiences. When I asked her how people in her neighborhood got along, she explained, well, it's almost, you know, at my middle school, there were more African-American people and Hispanics. There were almost no white people in there. So, and they all got along. So that wasn't a problem there. High school, same thing. It's mostly African-Americans and Hispanics and 5% white people. And Hispanics and Amer African Americans get along very well. Um, so I asked her, you know, can she give me some other examples of this, how this actually happened in her community? And she said, well, in church, they work together. African Americans help. I know a lot of African Americans who want the Latinos who are here illegally to become legal, and they try to do something to help them. And when I asked her if they received the same support from whites, she demurred, saying, well, some do, but it's not the same as it is with Blacks. Ramon had a similar positive feeling regarding Blacks that he did not feel was replicated among the white people he knew. Ramon was an undocumented worker from Mexico City who arrived in the U.S. in 1996, and I inquired about his experiences at his, at his job in construction, and he informed me that most of his co-workers were Black and American, which he uses here to mean white, and that he got along with all of them. However, he said, 
listen, I get along with the Americans. I get along well, but by chance, I get along better with Blacks. I get along much better with them. And well, I've never had any problem with anyone, not with Americans, not Blacks, but I've had better relationships with Blacks. So when I pressed him on why he thought this was the case, he stated, well, it's because since I left school, like I told you, I worked in construction and in factories, and I don't know, my friendships have always been with Blacks, and I began to rely more on them, I learned to talk like them and everything, and well, I don't know, my best friends, I have more Black friends than Americans, sometimes they come over to my house, there's one Black guy who's always been a good friend of the family, he is still, and he goes to my house and we eat together or whatever, I have a good relationship with them, yeah, strangely, yes. And I asked him, um, why do you think that's strange? And he said, because supposedly, supposedly they say that Blacks and Hispanics don't get along, but it's just much easier to call a Black person a friend than an American. Me with the Americans, I don't know why. I really can't. We clash a lot as if they don't like what I do and I do not like what they do. I don't know why. I don't know. I get along with Blacks. Yeah, because they've gone through what we're going through. You know, the problems that they've had for years from slavery and all that. The Americans have treated the Blacks badly to this day. They have the same problem that we have, racism. And because of this, we get along better. So Mexican immigrants throughout my study perceived Blacks as helpful and friendly, as members of their community, while whites were perceived as unreceptive. And in the cases where some Mexicans reported poor experiences with Blacks, they often dismiss these experiences as individual outliers and not representative as a group as a whole. And so as the contact literature suggests, this positive contact combined with an absence of resource competition appeared to play an important role in facilitating good relations between these groups. This positive contact alone, of course, was not sufficient in shoring up positive relations. There was also a need for a sense of common status and purpose, a key frame through which a collective minority status could be established. So in this next section, I'm gonna outline how a key shift in policy and attitudes against immigrants was instrumental in facilitating that change. So rapid economic expansion, as you can imagine, was at first welcome and necessary for economic growth in North Carolina. Unemployment remained low and in counties where working class whites and African-Americans were upwardly mobile, Latinx has filled a necessary economic void. Indeed, from 1990 to 2000, local and state policy towards immigrants as well as the community level reception was largely positive. However, over the next few years, the reception quickly chilled and by 2006, much of North Carolina had reversed its welcome to Latinos, a process that facilitated a sense of discrimination and shared minority status with African Americans. So as you may know, while the 287G provision of the IRA IRA Immigration Act was established in 1996, which allows local governments to partner with ICE and puts locals into deportation proceedings, that clause basically went unused until 2006 when the passage of the Real ID Act in many states made obtaining a driver's license illegal without a social security number or evidence of legal status impossible. So between 2006 and 2010, 287G became a key mechanism through which deportations occurred, and their use was frequently discriminatory. At the time, North Carolina had more 287G agreements than any other state, and because Real ID made individuals subject to inquiry at any traffic stop, everyday life suddenly became quite perilous for the undocumented Mexicans and riddled with discriminatory incidents for other Latinxes with legal status. In addition to the use of 287G participation in ICE sponsor programs, such as secure communities and statewide anti-immigrant measures, such as banning undocumented students from state community colleges, produced an onslaught of negative repercussions for Latinx migrants. The suddenness of this shift, moreover, meant that for many, this was not about immigration status, but rather was a deliberate attack on them as Latinos. So as a result, by the time I began my research, most Latinxes in the area articulated a sense of being suddenly and unfairly targeted for discrimination as racialized minorities. And the sense of exclusion was not unfounded as policy was also coupled with nasty rhetoric throughout the state, which many of you may remember, intended to further marginalize Mexicans and other Latinxes as fundamentally different than native born North Carolinians. For example, um, Sheriff Steve Bazell, who was of Johnson County, North Carolina, and they were also a 287G applicant county, had publicly acknowledged that his goal was to reduce, if not eliminate, the immigrant population of Johnson County. 
He's described Mexicans as trashy people who breed like rabbits and rape, rob, and murder American citizens. And I recognize now that our rhetoric has gone kind of off the rails, but this was certainly alarming to many people then, especially as it should be to you now, um, given that up until this point, there had been no kind of punitive discourse in, in the ether in North Carolina. And so as you can imagine, many immigrants began to feel paralyzed by fear, unable to go about their life without significant trepidation. Uh, one of my respondents, Elisa, put it this way. She said, um, I feel afraid. I have a lot of fear for my children. Well, because if they take me, my children, where are they going to stay? I have my son here, and I think about that a lot. I have to drive because I have to go to work or take my children to the doctor or to do my errands. I have to drive. So I asked her, are you always afraid? And she said, yes, I'm so afraid. When I see an officer go by or something, I feel sick. I pray to God. I tell him, please, God, take care of me. And so this growing sense of fear and marginalization, while undoubtedly and incredibly detrimental to the well-being of Mexican migrants, was essential to building bridges between Blacks and Mexicans through what they perceived as their common experience of racism and discrimination. For example, Diego, an undocumented mestizo immigrant from Guerrero, indicated that he had poor experiences with whites in comparison to the Blacks that he knew. He said, in some places that I go in a restaurant or a store, I've had more bad experiences with whites, with people of color, no. So I asked him if he would give me an example. And he said, an example is if I ask them for something or ask them something, they don't answer me. They look at me and turn around. There are some white people who, if I park my car next to them, they turn on the security alarm in their car. They think I'm gonna rob them. This is what I've noticed many, many times. And while it's easy to understand what they're doing, what they want me to understand with these things that they do, or they clutch their bags. And I said, oh, and he said, yeah, it's the same thing you see with someone of color, they do the same thing. So I clarified, white people do it to people of color. And he said, yeah, of course, of course. And with people of color, I've never noted it. Never have I seen someone close their bag or clutch their purse because they see me walking next to them. So, so here Diego's noting of the parallels between both groups being viewed as criminal and discriminated against are strong signals of what he perceived as both a shared commonality with blacks and a distance from whites. And so this growing sense of discrimination as a result of both negative attitudes and policies not only produced a sense of minority status and Latinxes, but also triggered a perspective of shared status and to an extent linked fate with African Americans. And so in this next section, I'm going to illustrate how community leaders played a pivotal role in reinforcing Mexican sense of equal or shared status with Blacks and a common enemy in whites. So um, as I noted, prior to 2006, there were very few exclusionary policies on the books as it pertains to Latinx immigrants. And discriminatory practices against Mexicans in the Southeast were relatively uncommon. However, as the negative public rhetoric around immigration increased, so did the sense among African-American leaders in these communities that Latinxes were experiencing a form of discrimination that was contrary to their views on civil rights and frankly, not so different from their experiences in the recent past or even today. There were various examples at both the national and the local level that substantiated Mexican perceptions that Black leaders were more willing to stand with undocumented migrants, while whites actively sought to discriminate against them. For example, the National Black Police Association signed a letter to President Obama demanding an end to 287G program in as early as 2009. And in 2010, the executive director wrote an op-ed in a variety of local newspapers voicing his organization's opposition to 287G, as well as secure communities and Arizona's SB 1070 law. Similar letters by local chapters of the organization were submitted across the country to local papers and were covered by Univision, underscoring the visibility of these letters in the Latinx community. Conversely, the National Sheriff's Association, which is almost exclusively comprised of white men, or at least was at the time, passed a 2010 resolution in support of ICE enforcement programs. Additionally, the North Carolina Sheriff's Association, which at the time was about 85% white, established a formal partnership with ICE in 2007, which was the only one of its kind in the country. And so these distinctions were important because despite the important role played by many white liberals in advocating for immigrants, they were frequently overshadowed by the political right, 
facilitating the perception that discriminatory practices were divided along racial lines. And so as a result, African-American leaders emerged as an important counterweight to the anti-immigrant discourse, while white sheriffs, political figures, and the conservative media were perceived as the key promoters of enforcement policies like 287G and secure communities that were making the lives of Latinx immigrants perilous. Locally, Black council members and police chiefs in Winston and Greensboro were also vocally against any enhanced policing that targeted Latinxes, further um, bolstering this perception. In the fall of 2008, a two-day conference was held in neighboring Greensboro that included civil rights activists, church leaders, and union organizers from Greensboro, from Winston, and other surrounding communities, explicitly with the purpose of forging Black Latinx relationships. They gathered in a local Baptist church and community center and various pastors and community representatives, African-American and Latino, spoke to the similar structural conditions faced by Black and Latinx communities, problems with gangs, with poor schools, with employment, institutional discrimination, violence, and exploitation. Uh, while there, one Latinx participant noted, my wife lost her license and cannot get it renewed, and she can't leave to go anywhere. And when the Black community in my church realized this, they went to the house and said they didn't know that I was illegal. I live in an Afro-American community and they got together 100 signatures asking the Department of Immigration not to deport me. They spoke with lawyers and the police chief not to work with ICE. Latinos can't do this. They can't ask for that, but Blacks can. The Office of Human Relations includes a Black pastor who's open to seeing the experience of Hispanos. We have the potential and capacity to work together to create a difference in our communities. I'm happy with the support of the Black community and the church is a good place for this, to understand the story of what's happened. In the Afro community, leaders have emerged to talk and work with us. They don't speak Spanish, but they're there with us, working to bring our communities together. And so this sense of empathy that many Black leaders displayed, as well as public gestures of advocacy and support from fellow church members, from neighbors, served to concretize Latinx's sense of shared discrimination as well as their positive intergroup perceptions with African Americans. Moreover, this perception was bolstered by the stratification of views on immigrant enforcement by race. So both locally and nationally, key white leaders often represented this enforcement view, while black leaders often advocated for immigrants using their political power to leverage support. And so these public expressions of concern regarding issues that face both the Latinx and African-American communities were not isolated incidents, but were rather part of an ongoing effort to build coalitions around their shared issues as minorities. Many Black leaders argued from the pulpit and elsewhere that as civil rights leaders, they must speak out against the situation facing Latinxes in their communities, in part because their experiences are not so different from the racism that they experienced as well. And so this experience of institutional discrimination combined with the sense that African Americans empathized with them and supported them was key in producing connections between the two groups. And in a context in which competition for resources was not an issue and Latinxes were incorporated into stable, relatively resource rich minority communities, it was the most salient framework in which race relations were produced. This was then reinforced by spatial closeness and positive community relations. And so the statements in the study are a testament to the impact of such practices on Latinx perceptions of identity formation and intergroup relations resulting in minority linked faith. So in focusing on local conditions in Winston-Salem Winston provides an example of the importance of local context and shows how under certain conditions, a sense of Black Latinx solidarity can emerge. By taking into account the role of two forms of status, both socioeconomic and racial, I've identified these conditions as the level of resource competition or unequal socioeconomic status, and a shared sense of equal racial status forged through the quality of contact, a sense of shared discrimination, and by establishing a common external threat. As I've noted before, it's important to know that while the literature highlights social status as an important force behind intergroup relations, it's largely been conceived of only as shared socioeconomic status in which race is folded in as epiphenomenal to class. 
Here, though, I want to conceive of status in two ways, showing that socioeconomic status and racial status play these distinct and yet complementary roles in shaping intergroup relations. And so while I study a single community in this book, by examining the conditions in recent research um, that look at Black Latinx relations, I think we can use these tools to better explain not only conflict, but also closeness, ambivalence, and shifting perceptions over time. And so uh, I show in the book that what developed here as a result of shared racial status was minority linked fate. And I also want to argue that this is not an isolated incident. So here in this slide, there's a shot of um, then newly elected uh, Gar um, Sheriff Gary McFadden of Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, where Charlotte is, um, who you may know was not the only one, but one was one of many first Black sheriffs elected in a wave of Black sheriffs in 2018, a record 20 out of 100 counties, um, many of which had never elected a Black sheriff before. And most of them, it was argued, won by running on a platform of ending 287G partnerships, as well as ending the over-policing of Black and Brown communities. Gerald Baker, who's also African-American of Wake County, was another uh, victor in the sheriff's race that year, beating out a longtime white Republican, Sheriff Donnie Harrison. Forsyth County also elected its first Black sheriff that year, Bobby Kimbrough. And all of these counties, as I also noted at the outset, saw record growth in their Latinx populations. And all of these sheriffs ran on this platform of ending over policing of Black and Latinx communities. I also want to make the case that this pattern of political victories is not specific to North Carolina, as many journalists across the country have noted that it is Black Democratic legislators who've been leading the charge against omnibus bills designed to punish and exclude undocumented immigrants in their state. Uh, and indeed, as states and municipalities are intensifying their use of punitive policies towards immigrants and creating a kind of patchwork of anti-immigrant policies and politics, African Americans in leadership positions are in fact intensifying their resistance to them. And my work on such efforts in other Southern states suggests that these alliances are not only on the rise, but can shape both policy outcomes and racial meanings throughout those states and communities. I think though that these shifts can be particularly apparent when we look at the work of youth activists. So a recent poll conducted by the New York Times and Siena College found that nearly 21% of Latinx voters so they participated in Black Lives Matter protests, and that's nearly identical to the number of Black voters, about 22%, who did so, suggesting that these actions and beliefs, while not universal, are durable and meaningful and are occurring at multiple generations. So in other words, for all the persistent framing of Blacks and Latinx is in conflict, their presence in the streets suggests otherwise. In my broader research agenda, I find that coalition building is indeed happening across the country, and this suggests that a more careful understanding of how race works, that is reshaping our identities and therefore our politics, has a significant impact on social change. So in sum, I think there are several broader political and social implications of this work worth noting. One, I believe that this work suggests a rejection of Black-Brown competition as a kind of broad thesis or baseline framework for understanding Black-Brown relations. Not only is there limited evidence to support this thesis, but it represents an ideological interpretation of race relations that I argue pushes us to continually explain and look for conflict rather than approach interracial relations as a process. In the context of the US, despite conventional wisdom that insists on Black Latinx tensions, and in many ways erases the longstanding presence of Afro Latinxes in the US, and that political assertion of Blackness has frequently served, um, and rather also erases that that political assertion of Blackness has frequently served as the basis for social activism and solidarity. Here, I think the most obvious historical example is of the Young Lords in the 1970s, who mobilized Puerto Ricans alongside the Black Panthers and others as part of a broad interracial coalition. Two, I think it suggests that we should reject the argument that Latinxes are inherently ideologically and politically conservative or inherently progressive and aligned with other minorities. This bifurcated framing, I think, misunderstands how race works in terms of meanings and categories and presumes political outcomes instead of priming us to do the work to unpack 
how distinctive circumstances can lead to distinctive outcomes. And three, it suggests that the time is ripe for new efforts to revisit Latinidad and anti-Black racism in the Latinx community. The emergence of critical Latinx studies, organizations like Mi Gente that specifically uh, frame their struggles as coalitional and transformative liberation movements, and a broadening social discourse that seeks to interrogate the ways in which anti-Blackness is embedded in Latinidad are especially timely in a moment of broad anti-racist struggle on the one hand and racist backlash on the other. And finally, I think the work signals that there's significant mutual support for shared anti-racist politics that can and does bear fruit. Political victories in Georgia in 2020 were achieved in part by a broad coalition of multiracial activists, and organizers and voters led by Black and Latinx activists. New sanctuary and new abolitionist movements that use shared racial status frames to articulate a sense of minority-linked fate have also gained traction, producing new kinds of progressive and anti-racist mobilizations that are transforming the way that we think about our anti-racist politics. With this work, I don't want to suggest that Black Latinx relations are by definition mutually supportive and politically generative. Often they're not. But I do hope that I've provided a framework to help us understand how such coalitions can happen and how racist discourses and social crises can sometimes lead to opportunities for social change. So I hope that I've uh, led with some provocations that will get us going in the Q&A. So I'm going to end here and open it up for questions. Thanks so much. Thank you. If you if you take off your share, we're going to put you in the middle of the screen. Great. You'll keep my face off so we can just see you. <laughs> um, um, I, I think we first want to uh, acknowledge that you have a note from um, Marcella Tara Cervantes, who is Associate Director of the Carolina Latinx Center, who is bidding you welcome and, and very happy that you're here. And again, we're so happy that they uh, co-sponsored this program. So we want to make sure that you know that they're here and listening in and supporting as well. Thank you. you so have, much. Yeah, absolutely. You have one uh, immediate question, and I do want to uh, reiterate to folks who are on the uh, call uh, that the chat function is open. Pardon me, the chat function is not open. It's the Q&A function that's open. So if you have questions, please go to the Q&A and um, just type your question in there, and we'll make sure that uh, Professor Jones gets your question. But you do have an immediate question from uh, Monica, Monica Evans. She's asking, did you speak to any Mexicans that identified as white? Did they respond differently in your survey in regards to their friendships and relationships with black people? Um, so I don't know that anyone identified as white over identifying as Latinx. So this is part of I think the outcome of racialization in this context was that people were uh, very reluctant to see themselves as white because they weren't being treated that way, right? The institutional discrimination meant for them that they were something else. But in terms of phenotype, there was a broad range of people in my study, um, some Afro-Latinx and some were essentially like blonde hair, blue eyes. And in fact, one of the, my key respondents who I quoted from, who talked about the fact that he had a best friend who was black, um, was someone who kind of changed my thinking in this study because he, he had like light hair and blue eyes. And I thought, well, this isn't really about phenotype. Um, and I was surprised to find that in fact, that didn't matter in ways that I thought that it would. I actually went to Winston-Salem with the intent of exploring the growing number of Afro-Mexican descendants who were there alongside that of Mestizo, Mexicans, and then Black and white communities with the assumption that it was going to be phenotype that shaped how people understood race relations and shaped their kind of relationships and their understanding of race. Turned out that that wasn't the story. The story was actually about how the political context 
had really made everybody feel attacked and discriminated against. And everyone interpreted that through the experiences of Black people in their communities and the story of the South. And so for very light-skinned uh, Mexican migrants, as well as very dark-skinned Mexican migrants, they talked about race in very similar ways. Um, there were some minor differences in that those who were dark-skinned were much more likely to talk about kind of cultural parody. They saw themselves as both as, both as Black, and so that meant something different to them. Um, but there wasn't a sense of distancing among lighter skin Latinxes. And to the extent that that happened, there was no patterning among phenotype. It really had to do more with people's experiences on the ground and whether they had felt discriminated against or not. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, we have another question. This is actually coming from Marcella. As a matter of fact, Dr. Jones, thank you so much for your work and insights. This was such a rich and fruitful discussion. I know this is a major discussion already with Black and Latinx folks. Uh, I found it interesting that your quotes, uh, people would describe Blacks versus Americans. But is there any discussion of the presence of Asian Americans and Native Americans in these spaces too? Um, not much at the time, and in part, I think that had to do with the fact that there were not significant numbers of visible um, Asian Americans and Native Americans in the communities that they're in. Um, but also, these are mostly relative newcomers, and so their experiences with the racial landscape are kind of limited to the communities they're in, especially as their movements are restricted by a lack of uh, of being able to drive legally. So they weren't as engaged. However, by the time we got to the point where a number of communities were considering 287G, the, it became kind of commonplace to have town halls. And in those spaces, a number of Asian Americans, especially South Asians, would begin to show up to those events. Um, as they were organizing, there was also a number of Muslim Americans that would start to show up to those kinds of events but they weren't really discussed in the same way in terms of a racial frame. It almost never came up when I asked people about how they understood the racial landscape or the racial order in, in Winston or North Carolina or the country. They only talked about Blacks, Whites, and Latinx communities. Um, and so there wasn't really much engagement with, with how other groups might matter in shaping the spaces. I suspect that's changed in recent months as uh, anti-American, anti-Asian American sentiment has become more um, popular, unfortunately, as well as how um, movements around settler colonialism and other issues facing Native communities have seen a little bit more public discussion, um, but at the time it wasn't part of the conversation. Did the age of the folks you interview influence or make a difference on how they felt? How was that received? And did you use the term Latinx? How was that received? Um, I didn't. I often felt very silly because I asked people to tell me what race they were and they were like, what? That's such a weird question. Um, and so I didn't use that term and I don't think anyone did at the time. I think it's a pretty recent term. Most people refer to themselves as Latino or Hispanic. Um, I didn't notice any patterns with age. The majority of my respondents were, uh, of my migrant respondents were of working age. So I didn't interview any youth, uh, although I encountered them in ethnographic contexts quite a bit. Um, but everyone, with the exception of Eliana, who was the daughter of, of another respondent of mine, was uh, college age or above, um, but most were kind of in their 30s and 40s. But I didn't note any kind of change. I should also point out that this research, I presented some interview data, but it's embedded in a broad um, year-long ethnographic study. And as I also did an analysis of newspapers in the Black press, in the Spanish language press, and the mainstream press as a way to kind of triangulate. And I didn't find any kind of outliers in that sense either. Um, the only difference I think that would be appreciable is that there were a small handful of longstanding Latino community members who had come to Winston for um, professional jobs, usually 
management in large uh, Fortune 500 companies or medical care and things like that. And they sometimes had a slightly different view of the landscape in terms of interpersonal race relations, but they had a very similar view in terms of how they understood the growing backlash against Latinos, which they were very surprised about. Okay, you have a similar question from Aaliyah. Thank you so much for your time and your lecture. As an individual who identifies as African-American and Latina, I am interested to hear if you met anyone who identified as both parties and how did that influence their response to the relationship between Blacks and Latinos? Um, I didn't meet people who, who identified as mixed, as in having one African-American parent and one Latinx parent, but I did meet plenty of people who were Afro-Latinx, as in they were Black people from Mexico who had settled in Winston. Um, and the main difference was really not about racial identity and politics in the hierarchical way. It was more that they perceived themselves to be more similar to Black communities. So they talked about like cultural similarities, a love of spicy food, things like that, or um, maybe different habits in terms of like family formation, other things, but they didn't really see a difference in terms of the Black community. Um, they also talked about the fact that they, there was some interesting like interracial marriage type questions that I had in which I thought there would be big differences, but most folks talked about the fact that um, they knew plenty of folks who had dated and married black people and for them, and both mestizo and Afro-descendant. And for them, that was, you know, those were love marriages. And when people married uh, quote unquote Americans, they thought that that was about uh, trying to acquire status, which I pointed out, um, of course, that it, you could get legal status from marrying a black person as well. But they had like a very particular idea of um, who was a citizen in this context. And so Afro-Latinx is in this case rarely diverged from mestizos in terms of like broader understandings of racial hierarchy, but they did sometimes talk about kind of internal anti-Black racism within the Latinx community. So they talked about the fact that some Puerto Ricans or mestizo Mexicans or Central Americans thought that they were better than some Afro descendants, which was interesting, but they did not see that as an intra-racial thing. Um, and I haven't totally made sense of that. I think there was some combination of like citizenship status because Puerto Ricans are citizens um, and skin color differentiation that they were articulating, but it didn't quite fit into the broader context of like political differentiation. Um, it's an interesting question though, because those groups are start are growing and also becoming more visible. And so it, I would be curious to know um, in follow-up studies, if people are, are doing them and are interested, um, how things have changed as the kind of second generation has grown up here in North Carolina. Thank you for the question. Sure. Uh, you have another question from Monica. Do you think your findings would be comparable in other Southern metro areas? I'm especially thinking of South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, where racialization is even more black white guess, if, and, and where rural urban boundaries are also blurring more. Yeah, um, I think it depends, <laughs> which is a kind of hedge. Um, I do see, you know, I alluded to it towards the conclusion that um, there's been a lot of coalition building in the metro Atlanta area where there have been large numbers of Latinx migrants alongside a kind of robust black middle class. And there have been, there's been a lot of organizing there. And I think in many ways contributed to the democratic victories in the Senate in 2020. Um, I, I think that there has been a lot of work in certain parts of Alabama. So in Birmingham, there's been a lot of coalitional work with the Civil Rights Institute and uh, the uh, Alabama Coalition for Immigrant Justice where they have organized um, together for things like the March on Selma and also against um, anti-immigrant laws and policies. So I do see those things happening, but I think they're heavily dependent on 
the way that the socioeconomic structure is framed. So are people, so I don't think that people necessarily compete or believe that they compete for jobs because they are the same class status, but it is sometimes the case that people do perceive that they are in competition in say working class neighborhoods. And so that can be an issue or there's a feeling of replacement in institutions like schools and housing that can create some friction and make it possible for alliances to form. I also think it depends on how people understand race. I don't think that race, it, it irritates me when I read the newspaper and there's a new piece about how Latinos voted in X place. And that must mean that Latinos are actually Republicans or Latinos are actually Democrats. And I don't think that that's how people understand <laughs> their identities and their group interests. And I don't think that's how categories work. There has to be some meaning making process. And so what I'm trying to unpack here are the kinds of pro things that happen in one's life experience that can lead to a racialized understanding of self, as opposed to one that's more focused on a kind of assimilation um, ideologies, right, where you can aspire to achieve the American dream and that you do so as an individual by working hard and having the right values and kind of staying out of trouble. I think when folks identify that there are institutional frameworks that are set up to punish them or exclude them or marginalize them, they have a different understanding of themselves and that triggers a kind of racialized status. And if that happens in concert with positive interaction with other racialized minorities, and a lack of competition right that blames them i think it's very likely that that can occur and i think that's happening in in places across the south but not uniformly so i would say for us to understand whether that's happening and maybe how we want to facilitate it we need to look at the conditions on the ground in terms of what those minority communities look like and what kinds of discourses are happening through organizations through politicians through civil society to make sense of what is likely to occur. All right. Um, you have another question, Marcia. This is a very interesting question, and, and I might add something to it. Um, she's asking, were you able to communicate with your participants in Spanish? Did that make a difference uh, in the interviewing process and the sort of making them feel comfortable process? Yes, so I did interviews in Spanish or English or both. Sometimes interviewees like started in English and then they switched to Spanish um, because they understood fine, but they wanted to make themselves understood better. Um, and I think it made a difference, certainly in terms of comfort level in that many folks I think had different levels of comfort with language, but also, and I write about this in the methodological appendix, it created this um, interesting dynamic where there weren't a lot of people who were not Latinx who spoke Spanish in the community at the time. And if they did, they were mostly white. <laughs> so people assumed that I must be Puerto Rican or Dominican or something in order to be able to speak Spanish and have those conversations. And so in some ways it not only made people feel more comfortable linguistically, but it also made them feel like we shared a kind of racialized status in a very specific way that we didn't, but often people asked me at the end of the interview where I was from and wanted to know more. Um, and so I think I unintentionally had more rapport with my respondents than I meant to because they made certain assumptions about my identity as a result of my ability to speak Spanish. Okay. Did you uh, have any uh, questions about the formation, the early formations of that community? We've heard of this idea of an anchor uh, set of families or individuals or businesses or sections. Uh, did you encounter that in any part of your work or did they sort of uh, reference that and how they happen to come of all places in this country uh, to, <laughs> to that part of, yeah. Yeah, I tried to uncover that directly. So there was no like single business that was recruiting, for example, like happened in Dalton, Georgia or something like that, or industry, people were coming for all kinds of reasons. Um, I think the earliest kind of working class migrants came in the Bracero era, but went back and then came back later. 
And then there were folks who left California in the 19, at the end, kind of 1990s. So in California in the 1990s, there was the Save Our State Initiative, which intended to do things in 1994, like ban undocumented migrants from the public school system. Um, it was mostly declared unconstitutional, but California was also experiencing economic decline. And so that combined with a very hostile political atmosphere, a lot of people left the state um, for other kind of hospitable warm states, but with a lower cost of living and more economic opportunity. And so lots of folks moved to North Carolina, um, but I'm not sure how the direct line of migration happened to Winston, especially from um, Guerrero and Oaxaca, which had never sent large numbers of migrants to the US. I spent time in both states talking to people. I went to the post office to find out like what were the trails of migration. And it was very clear that there were direct migration streams and everybody knew about Winston. They talked about it. People like often had like entire Carolina blue outfits and talked about going to Winston or Durham or not really Charlotte in those cases, but like various towns in those metro areas. And they had never seen North Carolina, like a map of North Carolina. So they didn't know where they were going. So there was clearly like a long stream and trajectory of folks who were going to these towns who thought who had connections there and felt like they would be able to settle. Um, but it wasn't clear to me that there was like a specific set of families or folks who were pioneers and then spread the word. I'm sure that there were, but I think it was probably multiple folks coming from different places at the same time. And then that kind of set up um, kind of two different streams of migration, one kind of from California and then another directly from Mexico. Um, and so I couldn't get very clear information on that. If you know the story, let me know, because I asked everybody I knew <laughs> in both um, Mexico and in North Carolina. Well, early in the, the stages of the opening of the Stone Center, we did do a program on it. We actually did an exhibition uh, with Wendy Phillips um, that focused on those communities. And we did find something out. So I'll call you. Okay. <laughs> I, know, well, I know that every call. city has its own stream. And so... Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it was very different depending on where where we were, um, right. even in the city itself. Yeah, they talked a little bit about the draw of the, of the I guess, the furniture making industry at one point. Yes, yeah. yeah. So that Eastern would have been like for the Eastern Carolina. Burlington, yeah, yeah. There was some in Burlington in that area, but that there are some that then began to draw because everybody couldn't build furniture when you bring your other family members. And I'm rambling. So I'm going to stop rambling. <laughs> and I'm going to thank you. And I want to thank um, Josmel Perez, who's joined us, who's actually the director of the Carolina uh, Latinx Center. Uh, welcome to him. He's the one that asked the question about Latinx uh, for obvious reasons, uh, that these are changes that are happening in different parts of the state and, and here as well. But more than anything else, thank you so much again for doing this work and for being willing to share it so openly and particularly what your trajectory is now. We look forward to you coming back. And when you come through again, you absolutely have to come through here. We would love to have you in person. We would love to see anybody in person these days. We're so tired of Zoom. We're so tired of Zoom. We don't, yeah, yeah, we're tired of Zoom. We don't know what to do. Before we go, I also want to thank uh, Sharif, who's program manager here, who's done so much uh, uh, around the logistics, helping us identify folks like you and making sure that everything is done in a way that allows people to participate. Uh, there's one last question that just slipped in. Oh, it just says, yes, thank you. And we want to offer an open invitation. So thank that's you so from much. our myself. I will take you up on that. <laughs> All right, we're looking forward to it. So thank you to the community of folks that joined us. Thank you for continuing to support us. And also thank you for being so welcoming to our guest tonight. And we look forward to having her here as part of the family. Everyone, please have a good evening. Um, do something really nice tonight. If you come to North Carolina, you gotta go to Winston-Salem now. We gotta go see how things are happening there and to make sure that we offer our support as well. Yeah, check it All out. All right then, thanks again. Thank you. All right, bye-bye.